Today on Vulnerable, I sit down with actress, producer, Hallmark star, philanthropist, writer, blogger, and entrepreneur Nikki Deloach. You may remember her from MTV's Awkward, many Hallmark movies, and as a member of her popular 90s cult classic show, The Mickey Mouse Club. Alongside Britney Spears, Justin Timberlake, Christina Aguilera, to name a few of this iconic cast, including herself. And when she isn't gracing our screens, Nikki is busy being a mom to two boys, a philanthropist working with organizations such as Children's Hospital Los Angeles, Mind What Matters, and the Alzheimer's Association. I was really, really proud of our conversation. We unpacked a lot of really big topics, including childcare, um, motherhood, uh, basically healthcare in America, uh, and uh, and also just like Christmas and visibility and Hallmark as it stands right now. So I hope you do enjoy this episode of Vulnerable. Nikki! Hi! Hi! How are you? I feel like so many things have happened just in you walking the door. Yeah, I spilled my coffee. Yeah. We talked about all the things. <laughs> I think we've t- touched upon everything. Coffee, exercise, Some face, face stuff, stuff to help keep your skin tight, <laughs> um, parenthood. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, my love, I haven't seen you since uh, we were together. 90s con. Yeah. Yeah. And I, 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 I it was snowing outside. It of was. course it was, because it was like a Hallmark movie when I met you. I, <laughs> we just bring the Hallmark everywhere. We were in we Connecticut. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> I love Connecticut. We were in a fancy hotel. I know. Don't you love hotels? <laughs> Yeah. I mean, especially as a mom, you're like, yeah. Oh, yeah. I like hotels. I'm sleep. True, true. It's very true. I'll make a I'll make a bed of anything these days, though. Okay, like an air yeah. an airplane seat. Mm. Or how old are your kids? Five and three. Five and three. So yeah. I also have a five year old. Yeah, you're in it. Yeah, because <laughs> my oldest is nine, so he can get himself dressed in the morning for yes. school okay. and brush his teeth and brush his hair mm-hmm. and do what he can even make eggs and Ooh. you know a quesadilla and you know stuff like that yeah. so but you are in that place where you have two tiny ones completely still dependent mm-hmm. on you mm-hmm. that's really hard thank you thank yeah. you for acknowledging that and yeah. we acknowledge all the moms out there that hey moms and we dads. see you yeah it's hard to to dub, the, the the doubles right or like yeah. more than multiple children it definitely makes yeah. it makes a bit of difference. It does. Wouldn't you say? It does. <laughs> Not yes. that one is hard, but what I'll say is that when you don't have a village, which I feel like most of us really don't, mm. when we don't live close to home yeah. or we don't have My young. family's in Georgia. Yeah. So I live literally all the way across the country. Yeah. I think about it all the time because my sister lives, my whole family lives on this beautiful, gorgeous farm in South Georgia. It's uh, on his property called, it was my grandfather's keeper property. So it's the first property my grandfather ever bought many, many, many moons ago. And each house is situated in inside of a pecan orchard. And then it's also a working farm. It's gorgeous. But my sister lives, you know, you can throw a rock and hit her house from my mom's house. My uncle also lives on the property. Cousins live on the property. My grandmother lives on the property. Um, and I'm like... You don't get it's like a how commune. lucky I call it the compound. Actually, <laughs> yeah, I, I call that. it the compound. I'm, I'm like, you don't understand how lucky you are to just have like a literal village, like a literal village <laughs> surrounding you that you can pick up the phone and call mom and say, I-, "I can't get out of work to take Molly Kate to golf. Can you run her up to golf for me? I'll pick her up." You have to pay someone to do that. Yeah, absolutely. you know, in California, and it's it ain't cheap. And by the way, like you have to. Uh, there's a season of which, when you're a new parent, yeah, that every new parent has to kind of engage with, which is the quality of the child care. Oh, and yes. I don't think we talk about it enough because yes. I think a lot of us want to pretend like, oh, look at how great I'm doing. This is so easy. And like, honestly. Uh, domestic worker yeah. and people who are yes. child care providers, like they, they, they are like invisible workers. Yes, yeah. Um, and 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 so the ones that are truly good, mm-hmm. I feel like they've almost had to become okay with being invisible. Yeah, it's <sighs> it's really it's a tough. That's really tough. We were lucky enough for three years to have this 
incredible girl. Her name is Lucy. She's sissy now. She's like literally our family. Yeah. She's like my third child. She was in her 20s. And she came into our life. It was so, such a divine, mm-hmm. sacred contract because, you know, I had just gotten newly pregnant with Bennett and Hudson was three. And I was about to go to Canada to film A Perfect Catch for Hallmark. Yeah. And um, the the person who was helping us at the time was going through some really hard personal stuff. And then a week before I was supposed to leave town was like, I, I just, I can't do it. I need to take time. I've had similar experiences. And I was but like, please, yeah, oh my God. God. I'm going to leave town for like a month and my husband goes to an office every day who's going to take care of my child. This and Just panic. Yeah. And I had remembered... Um, she was my student. Lucy was my student at the acting studio and had just randomly come up to me one time and said, you know, I'm a caregiver. I've worked in um, hospice. I've done a lot of caregiving. I've done a lot of babysitting in my life. If you ever need help, I'm just putting it out there. Um, you know, please give me a call. She gave me her information. So I go, oh, wait, what about that girl? Yeah. The one, you, know, you get desperate. And then she Before you know the person's oh, good. You get desperate. <laughs> and so I called her right away and she showed up to the house with a top hat and a guitar and a bag that looked just like the bag that Mary Poppins has. So she became Lucy Poppins. And she was this literal angel that came into our lives and she was like, and I and I wanted her to stay forever. And she's like, I'll stay into the winds change. She just says like, this? Just like Mary Poppins. <laughs> it, I mean, I, this is all true. And then Pretty, like months after that, I found out about Bennett's heart. I was five months pregnant, and I found out he had, well, at the time, we only knew about three of the congenital heart defects. When they went in to do surgery at five days old, they found a fourth, that like a very serious one that was in there that they couldn't see on an echocardiogram. So we find out about this diagnosis. I'm five months pregnant. I come home. My whole system, I'm just in shock. I don't even know what to do. The odds, the statistics are really bad on his him making it. And I say to her, I, 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 she's like, what can I do? How can I help? And I said, you know what? I, you are young. I don't know if this is something you need to do. You really need to go home and think about it because I don't know what we're facing. I don't know what's ahead. Yeah. I feel like this is going to get really it, – this is going to be the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And I don't want to do that to you. And she came back on Monday. She took the weekend and she came back on Monday. And I opened the door. It always makes me like mm-hmm. emotional to think about it because um, she had this little box with these little heart earrings. And um, she gave it to me and I opened them. And I just it, like took my breath away. And she's like, I'm here. I'm here till however long you need me to get your family through this. Mm-hmm. And I, she did, she stayed for all three heart surgeries until Bennett was on the other side and he was doing okay. And so we experienced caregiving in a very different way. There was no invisibility. It was me and her. Like we joked because we would travel with the kids and everybody thought we were like- You were a wife. Like she was my wife. She's your wife. And so (laughs) I called her my sister wife and in my phone, she's called my sister wife. Yeah. And so she actually happens to be staying with us now from London. She came in for Bennett's birthday and is still here. Does she and have a British accent? No. Okay, she I was going to say she truly is Mary Poppins. She is truly Mary Poppins. <laughs> um, but she stayed to help us out through this like time where work is so much right now. Mm-hmm. And um, but she's a beautiful artist and an incredible singer and storyteller and playwright. Does she have a, a, a an Instagram or anything? yes? Okay, well, yes. You Lucy McNair is is her name. Go follow her on Instagram. You will see her music. You will see her art. You will see what she does. She is a spectacular human being. And so I can't go back to the caregiving, that 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 person that's in your home where they're just kind of there. Mm-hmm. It's like, I don't do that. Like if you're coming into our home and you are with me, you are part of our family, which makes mm-hmm. it hard to find that perfect match, that mm-hmm. perfect person that like they want to be a part of your family as much as you want them to be a part of your family because they're taking care of the, the most precious things that you have. Your children are the most important thing. And like for me, that, that that's it, mm-hmm. my children. 
And so it's this special relationship you have to find, and it's really hard to find it. So when you have somebody that's coming into your house and taking care of your kids. Take care of them. You take care of them. Mm -hmm. Whatever they need, Uh you give it because you're a unit. You are a family that's doing this thing together. You have to build your own village. (laughs) Honey, I'm so glad we started talking about this. This feels so good to me. Thank you so much. Yeah. We didn't get to chat about all this because when we, you know, when we met, yeah. really exclusively, I know we probably run into each other. Yeah. Um, but we really got to sit in a green room and just sort of chat mm-hmm. and we talked. We talked about, well, why doesn't Christy have a Hallmark movie yet? I'm just going to oh, throw no, it out there. That's true. <laughs> I was that, that actually was thinking about that driving here today. Aww. I was like, why we have got to get this woman on Hallmark? She hey, is a Hallmark. If girl. you're producing it, I will absolutely do it. Yes. I will. <laughs> Thank you. That would be amazing. And I think that fans would like to see that. They too. would love what? to see you on I our network. Told. Are you kidding? Okay. Um, but no, honestly, it, it, we didn't get to chat a lot. But no. I just I could see that your spirit was so amazingly open, mm-hmm. especially for someone who's been. Speaking of family, in in the industry for as long as you have, like working and building your career and, you know, your husband was also yeah. in the pop game yes. for a minute. Yes. yes. <laughs> I grew up with both Innocence and Take Five. Like, I know, I know you I guys. I mean, <laughs> it's crazy when they, if you meet Ryan today, this is my husband. He's an entertainment attorney. Amazing. He is, yes, he, um, I know, once we left the music industry, he, I was like, well, I'm going to go back to L.A. and go back to acting. This music thing is not for me. And he was like, well, I think I'm going to go to law school. I was like, this might work out. <laughs> like, this actually might work out. Because if you're going to continue with this boy band situation, I was going to have to just, like, hit the road. Hey, man, um, know your limits. But I know. It's crazy. You would never think by meeting him that he was ever in a boy band with, like, yeah. the frosted tips and, oh, the, 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 like, the whole thing. He did the, the whole thing. the frosted tips. Giant, tall hair. No. And all the top part of it was, like, frosted. Did he have the earring? He did not have the earring. Okay, that was a different boy band member, the bad boy. Yeah, (laughs) he did not have the earring, but it it's it was he was a sight to behold. No, but come on, how did you guys meet? Like, was it? Yeah, so we we had known each other. I think the first time I met him, he was seventeen. I was eighteen, and we were just friends for a while, living in Orlando. All of the boy band, girl band stuff was happening down there, and we were all kind of a part of the same camp, and then. As we got older, I became single. Um, He asked me out. I was not looking for any kind of relationship. I had gotten out of a really long relationship Mm -hmm. and was very much just very gun shy. And and he was like, well, just – what if I just came to your house and brought Chinese food and we just sat on your porch and ate? Number one – I will never turn down Chinese food. <laughs> you knew the way to your heart. I just like ever <laughs> or food of any kind. Sure. Um, and so I was like, yeah, that sounds that's fine. So he came over uh-huh. with a bottle of wine and Chinese food. We sat outside in the porch. We talked, and I was like, oh, he's not like a kid kid. He's kind of, you know, way more mature than I thought. He's incredibly bright, which is my biggest like turn on. I love smart, smart men. Um, and uh, and that was it. And we just kind of casually dated for a while. Yeah. And then finally, oh, I was like 21, and we were like, let's let's give this thing a shot and see, like, if this is going to work out and cut to, you know, however many years later we've been together ever since. So I find that ironic because you must believe in, like, fast – amazing romantic love that like is hallmark in so many of the parts and <laughs> the scripts you've written and stuff like that i but i do like how how what is your relationship no to- i'm slow to the game got it i'm slow to the game i want to get to know you i want to i am a relationship person i'm not a dater i am terrible with the dating situation because it's like at the end and they want to kiss you and what if you don't want to kiss them and then you don't want to hurt their feelings and it's a thing and it's like (laughs) I just like no I don't want to do that I want to get to know you and if I like you I'll go on a date with you Mm -hmm. that's always been my my way that's really good yeah so I'm kind of like 
yeah, I'm a little different than the Hallmark movies where it's just like being swept up by your feet. I, I'm not a like sweep me off my feet kind of person. <laughs> I'm more like, let's sit down and really get to know each other first. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. That's amazing. I would want that for my daughters. Yeah. I truly would want them. But at the same time, mm -hmm. we're talking about these tropes right. and, and these romance tropes and whatnot. And like, I, 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 it's hard because I'm literally the opposite, right? Like I'm, I'm hard and fast. Mm. When I went on my husband and I's first date, it yeah. was at a coffee shop because we were in the same screenwriting class together. Ah. And I thought he was out of my league. I had a really, really bad breakup. Mm. And um, it forced me kind of to move to New York. And I was like taking time off the business. And I was trying to get my head together. But I was in a dark place. And mm. then I was like, no, he's so good looking. He's so put together. He was like a former Marine. And I was like, oh, he's got, he's, look at this guy. But then... I kind of tried my, I tried to shoot my shot, as they say, yeah. and I kind of flirted with him and he like, he like took the ball around. He's like, let's get coffee. And I was like, okay. So what happened was, is we sit down and I just start like, like word vomit. Right. Like I was like, this is who I am. These are all this my is issues. This my social security if you don't number. Me, this like, is my address. I'm sorry that I'm broken. <laughs> and he was just like, I'll fix you. <laughs> he didn't know he like signed up for that. Um, right. But honestly, like. I just think that I don't know, and I and I would say sometimes like I'll laugh to people, be like I played a numbers game mm. <laughs> with my heart, mm -hmm. but it really is like now that I have two daughters, mm -hmm. I'm like well, what do how do I want them to approach love, love their bodies, consent, like everything, everything. Mm -hmm. I think that we have, you know. It's a really interesting conversation because I have two boys, so I'm having the same conversations but in a different way, right? So with them, it's respecting your body, respecting yourself, having agency over your choices, and respecting women and their bodies and their choices. And, what. And you know, I live in L.A., there, and I walk around my son's school, and those girls, I love it. They are so empowered in their voice and in their body. Mm -hmm. And they're like, you know, they will tell those boys what is up. I have watched it. <laughs> and I'm like, we are doing something right as parents mm -hmm. because I am seeing generations of young girls who are saying, yeah, that's not okay with me. <laughs> and this is my opinion. And this is what I think. And this is how I feel. And no, you can't sit next to me. Or no, you can't, you know, that mm -hmm. makes me feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there's something so cool. We, I didn't get that option especially growing up in the South. Oh, yeah. It was, it's better to be seen and not heard. I was told every day of my life. And every day? Every day of my life. Oh, okay. It's better to be seen and not heard. And so there was a big emphasis on how you looked and how you presented yourself. But as a girl, you are not allowed to give your opinion and you are not allowed to say, I feel uncomfortable with that. And um, it took me so long in my life to get to a place where I it, honestly, it took me, I mean, I was working super hard on it for years, but it was really Bennett and what I went through with Bennett that made me not only an advocate for him, it made me an advocate for myself. Interesting. Yeah. And, but that didn't hit me until I was much older Yep, in my thirties. Yeah. Which is, it makes me sad because when I think about being young and being a young girl and all the times that I betrayed myself to make other people feel comfortable. I mean, it's countless times that I countless. think females generally uh, dissociate from those I feel uncomfortable moments, statements too. Yes. Like they don't even verbalize it. Yeah. So that is, yeah. and it is really amazing to see that all this generational trauma is being broken by oh. our, this generation of parents. I think we, well, we are the generation that's doing it mm -hmm. and we get to carry that. That's, that's, that is quite a trophy. <laughs> You know, when we take our last breaths in this world to know that, like, we inspired a different generation of kids, a kids that have a voice and they will stand up for themselves. And that's huge. Yeah, it is beautiful. It just would be help. It would be helpful if we had some help. Because, <laughs> like, what the hell? Like, I'm on TikTok and everybody recognizes that, like, Gen right. X and, and boomers. Are they're not that helpful? This is an unpopular yeah. opinion. They're busy. They're retired. Yeah. They're living their best lives. Yeah. Glamas, I call them. And, 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 and God love them, like, sure, live your life. Well, if you think about that generation, right, they were raised in a time in our country where it was me, 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 now, 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 mine, mine, mine. You know, my grandparents, they were coming out of um, Great Depression. Mm -hmm. They were coming out of war. They were coming, and they were building, you know, 
they were trying to build a world to give their kids everything they didn't have. So then that generation grows up, those boomers, and they are given everything by their parents, you know? Like that they can't even afford. That they can't even afford. Yeah. And and so what happens to that generation as they get older, there's a there's a certain level of narcissism that comes along with that. And um and just self-absorption, right? And I'm not saying this is everyone no, because course. I have, you know, there are friends of mine that have parents that are boomers that are so involved yeah. in their kids and their families' lives. But but there is a, a trend. Whole, There's a trend. Here. They didn't take care of our environment. Uh -huh. They didn't care. there were a lot of things in our country. It was consumption, consumption, consumption. We actually were the first generation that came along and said, if you're going to consume, there's going to be a giving back element. Remember Tom Shoes and all those companies that started those? That's our generation. Mm -hmm. So now we know that we're not only the first generation that's teaching our children how to have agency and how to have a voice, we were the first generation to say, we also have to take care of our world because there's going to be nothing left for our kids and for our grandchildren if we don't because the generations before us did nothing to preserve the, where we live. Yeah. And so it's 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 a it's a lot of work that we have to do to undo a lot of damage that was done before us. Yeah, it's hard to have relationships that aren't surface level with these folks because you know, uh, they only want to hear a certain narrative. Yeah. They only want the very uh, sanitized version of the world. And I do find it really interesting that we're talking about this because you as an entity now working with a new Hallmark, we'll yeah, call it. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 how are you feeling about the work that you're doing and the stories that are coming out? And also as a producer oh, yeah. of the content, mm -hmm. how are you in injecting like a, th a more three-dimensional right. tone into your pieces? Well, I was, I actually was very like, so the first movie I produced for Hallmark six years ago, actually, it was the first movie that I pitched them. And this was old, the old Hallmark, right? Um, it was a divorced family that had to kind of deal with the holiday shuffle. And it was a family that the parents were divorced. They were coming together one last time. The, the, the matriarch, the grandmother had passed away and they were going to spend Christmas in her house for one last time before they sell the house. And, and, and the parents were, they had not been in a room together for years. And I remember pitching this to them. And I said, I just think that with 50% of the population being divorced, and we're trying to tell stories that are reflective of what our audience is going through, it's really important to show them like, we see you. Not every family is perfect. Not every, you know, young lead has it all together. And she's just like, you know, her only fault is that she loves too hard. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, we, we, we got to get a little bit deeper with these stories. And they allowed me to produce it. I said, I promise you, I'm not going to take you into a dark valley. You know, I'll keep the tone right. I know how to do this. And I was lucky they trusted me. Was that, I wonder if this was after SNL. Do you remember that SNL skit that they did kind of roasting it the Hallmark movie? It was after SNL. Because I was chatting with Michelle Vickery at the time oh, yeah. to try to set up like, you know, meetings for me. Right. I, I, I actually at one point did talk to, um, you know, the guy who was in Bill. charge. Yeah. And everybody's really friendly, mm -hmm. but they had a very strict protocol. And so I was like, and then I even had like casting, bless their, bless their hearts. They were like, so what season are you? What, what season would we cast you as? Right. And I was like, I'm yeah. a winter. I You're like, like Christmas? I'm a Christmas. Duh. But, like, but like, no lie. I'm a Christmas queen. I am technically a winter. <laughs> I one time saw this lady. This is completely arbitrary. I one time saw this lady because I had a lot of shame being from like a middle class, like like lower middle class Italian family that, you know, my mom was a farm girl from Ohio and my dad was <laughs> my like- My dad a, was a farm boy. Okay. And yeah, like, same by but, the way. But my mom just, she she would kind of push me. She had great style, but she would like push me to do a lot of the socializing. And then I became this like- <sighs> extroverted introvert to be this actor yeah. and to be and so she'd be like get the you have to get the waiter to sign the check she just had an issue with confrontation mm. and and then I notice as I get older too like we're just not the same person like who I would present myself to be so Ex well 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I did hire somebody to, to teach me etiquette when I was mm. like 21, 22. Oh, interesting. And she told me I'm a winter. So I am a winter. <laughs> well, there you go. I think you're a Christmas queen. <gasps> oh, thank you. But it's true. It's like now we get to, we are telling deeper, richer, bigger stories. Inclusive, dynamic. Inclusive, (laughs) dynamic. And the way the Hallmark thinks about it now, the mindset that's happening at our network is, you know, every movie, you know, our audience is very diverse, actually. The same, some of the same people that watch Hallmark also watched Game of Thrones or Secession, you know. And then, yes, there's a a large unit of of the audience that watches Fox News and then watches Hallmark. Like, but it's diverse. And so the way that they're looking at it now is we want to give something for everyone. We want everybody to see themselves in at least one or handfuls of our movies. And... I love that because, you know, they're doing a Kwanzaa movie. They're doing... That's amazing. It's amazing because it's like, let's make sure that everything and everyone is represented here and let's create that space. And I just am so proud of how far we've come in our storytelling. And I was like, guys, our audience can not just handle this. They want it. They're hungry for it. I would sit at these Christmas cons Mm -hmm. and as a producer and writer for the network, I would say, what story haven't you heard that you want? Smart. What do you want more of? You were doing the work. I was doing the work (laughs) years ago at all the conventions, all the lineup, all those people that would come up. I would ask them the same question. What What haven't you seen that you would like to see? And time after time after time again, it was deeper stories, stories that look more like me. It seems like the girls coming into this, like, they feel very privileged. I'm, I, you know, I don't come from money. I would like to see myself in that. Or, you know, I would like to see, like, I'm a a black woman. I Mm -hmm. want to see, like, you know, a a woman in a leading role Mm -hmm. who is black, who is not the sidekick friend. Yeah. Duh. Like, you know, there you got all like everyone was like, I just want to see myself and I want deeper, richer, fuller stories, more real. I want it more real. And so I I I think that the network took all of that and said, okay, let's make sure that we have something for everyone. And I love it because for the longest time, you know, I would be told. I do comedy, but I also do drama. Yeah. And, you know, I'm a crier. Like, if something's sad, I'm going to cry. And they would go, no, 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 Just, like, we don't want to have the the tears. Just, like, one single solitary tear. And I'd be like, okay. You know, because they didn't want to face. They wanted you to still look pretty, right? And I was like, I cry like Claire Danes in Homeland, man. I am not an, an, a pretty crier. It's not pretty. I am not a pretty crier. Oh, no. And so anyway, I now, like especially this movie that is coming out on the December gift, 10th. The Gift of Peace coming out December, December 12th. 10th, December 10th Sorry. on Hallmark Movies and Mysteries. Yes. It is emotional. It's <gasps> the most emotional movie they've done. And oh, I can't wait to see that. It's really deep. It's the okay. first collaboration they did with Dayspring, which is their faith based yeah. card line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is huge. Yeah, like Candace has something with them or something. She right? does. Yeah, I yeah. mean, they have 6,000 products, yep. like between Bibles and books and, and aprons and, and aprons and very, all the things. Yeah. They're a huge company. And um, so this is the first collaboration. I'm a deep person of faith. It's my anchor, it's my rock. That's so amazing. being able to do that was. It really an honor, and it was very cool to be able to talk about God in one of these movies and faith and what it looks like to be in the depths of your grief and pain and finding God in that. Dude, the holidays are such Oof. a sad time for so many people. Oh, and, yes. And Last they feel year, isolated, and they need community. Yes. So I think a movie like this is really going to help a lot of people. I I think so. I hope so. I mean, I lost my dad last July. Mm-hmm. He was 66. Mm-hmm. It was awful. I watched him die from the, his toes up to his heart. And I went into the holiday season. I mean, I've never in my life done this, but Christmas Day, I was like, I just want it to be over. I just, I, it has to be over. I can't, like, I can't. Mm-hmm. It was so painful. 
and I didn't know how to. Nobody knows how to do grief. Yeah. I'm a straight A student, right? I'm the the type like I'm that typical type A. Like, yeah, me so too. I got all the books. Yeah. I was like, I'm gonna be the best griever in the world. I'm gonna know exactly what to do, and it leveled me. It is a monster, yeah. and nobody knows what they're gonna look like inside grief, and that's the truth. And so coming a year later, circle around to a year later, I'm going to film this movie. Hallmark offers me a movie on grief. And I'm like, no, I no, I can't. I just want to make people laugh. And they're like, nope, this is the one we want you to do. And I read it and I was like, wow, this is like, a, this is a very special story. It's a really special story. Oh. But I was very much like the leading character, Tracy. Mm -hmm. I went to school for psychology. I've been in therapy since I was young, yet I was so stuck in my grief and didn't know how to find my way out. I couldn't find the joy. I was getting stuck in my work. I didn't want to leave my house. I didn't want to be around people. It felt, all of it felt so heavy and hard. Mm -hmm. And literally, like the character, I found throughout the whole process of filming it, oh my goodness, like I'm not sharing this. I'm not letting somebody else help me carry this. Mm -hmm. I, we're not supposed to carry our pain and our grief alone, like right. you said. The village. Community, mm -hmm. the village, you know. And so I hope this movie does for other people what it did for me and Brennan, my co-star, who was also in his own grief because his wife is battling cancer and has been for six years. And she was diagnosed or she got her cancer came back for a fourth time right before we went to film this movie. So Brennan was in the heaviest of heavy-hearted places coming into it with anticipatory grief. Wow. So the both of us just held each other's hands and looked at each other and was like, we're, we're going to do this and we're going to do it together, and came out very much changed as human beings. This is an important movie. It's I, very important. I want everyone to watch it because I'm going to watch December 10th. December 10th. Okay. A Gift of Peace. I'm sure you have other things that are in development with Hallmark. I do. That's I amazing. Have, thank you. I have two Christmas movies that we're writing for mm -hmm. next year. Mm -hmm. One of them I would star in. And the other is uh, based on a true story that's really fun and hysterical. It's really funny. <laughs> um, and then actually we just got hired to do uh, to write a mystery wheel for them. And it, this one is – it's I, I can't say what it's about yet, but what I will say, I'd love to come back and talk, to, talk <gasps> oh, about yeah, it because please. what I would say is it is um, – they've never done anything like it. It is um, – it's uh, it it's a lot of social justice that happens in there oh, about wow. the justice system and legal system and 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 um, it's it's very exciting. It's like it's something really new for our uh, for our audience, and I think they're gonna love it. I bet they are. Yeah. We can't we can't assume that just because people are you know a very large spectrum of people that they don't they're not interested in things for sure no and 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 the truth of the matter is is i think no matter whether you're a democrat or republican you want justice yeah you want justice you want you know it, and that's something that i think crosses all lines it's like you know if somebody is not guilty for something you want them to be able to be innocent and if somebody is guilty you want justice to be served and yeah. we want to know that we ha live in a system and live in a world where truth is going to r reign supreme um and so it's really that's 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 what it's about at its core this is amazing this is not a, this is not the hallmark that we know. right <laughs> but I, but it's exciting it's very it's fun. So yeah. we're writing that, and then we have. And it's you say we. I think you're me and my writing partner, Meg? Megan, mm -hmm. uh, Megan McNulty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's so she's my writing producing partner, and so yeah, we That's have awesome. We have about four projects with Hallmark that we're writing okay. right now, and then I have a movie that I'm producing that's filming in Ottawa right now. Okay, that is also a mystery. Um, it's uh, Janelle Parrish mm -hmm. is the lead of it, and she's lovely and wonderful, and um, and it's about a genealogist who helps to reunite families and reunite people or find lost loved ones, and so it's there's mystery to it, but it's more of like a pull at your tug at your heartstrings drama wheel. Good, make yeah. people feel things. Yeah, right? yeah, <laughs> yeah. Them start discussion. Yeah, 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 yeah. I do in in terms of feeling things because I know. I, I mean, you're, yeah, we're here, yeah? Yeah. Um, let's talk about a lot of the amazing work you're doing. So oh, you, you, you're you talking about your dad, yeah. and I'm so sorry. Thank you. For everything you went through. I lost my dad 
I want to say like six six years ago, and I kind of oh, watched him go fast from cancer. I'm so sorry. And I and I know I I, I under I hear you in that in that way that another person is lost. Were you really close to your dad? I was. We had a he was a complicated guy. Yeah. But I almost think in hearing you talk about grief, that that was his greatest gift to me. Mm-hmm. Was mm-hmm. that I knew he was a limited person, mm. and I think with the relationship that you know other folks might have with their parents being yeah. like super strong and like this person I respect them so much, yeah. like I'm sure that that grief looks different and it looks different for everybody based on the That's, relationship. That is exactly right. But there were stages, and it was hard, it's and it hard. took time. It takes so much time. Yeah, and I do think it does complicate your grief. When you don't have, when you didn't have the relationship you might have desired, mm-hmm. and you didn't, you didn't get the things you needed from that relationship, it complicates grief because then you there's you don't get it. There's no chance to get it back. Mo, I have four, I have three siblings, and two of my siblings, their grief with it has taken a toll on them. Yeah, quite a lot actually. Yes. I can see it in their parenting and their lives, and yep. and it's uh yeah, it's been a rough. It's been rough years for them because they haven't really addressed their grief with oh. with, with a blueprint. Um, so yep. let me say, so you've been doing work for and on behalf of Alzheimer's. That's right. And so do you want to, and also we should mention with the Children's Hospital That's here. Right. Which is an amazing place. It's the best. Disney used to make us go there. Really? They'd be like, you get your butt there and you meet those kids. And we were like, oh, okay. bless you. And Thank we, you. And we loved going. It makes going. such a difference. Every Christmas we would go and they'd have like a little prom or like a holiday yes. party, right? Yeah. Have a holiday party. They get dressed please up. Please let me come again. I want to come I back. Will. <laughs> I Honestly, yeah. It's, um, I'll start with the Alzheimer's. Um, the moment my dad was diagnosed, mm-hmm. um, I... You know, I, I'm kind of a person who goes, okay, I got to do something with this pain. I was a dancer when I was young, and so I knew that, like, I dancing helped me to move trauma out of my body, tra- trauma that I experienced as a child. And it was the way that I healed. It was the way that I uh, kind of processed. And we all need that, and or else we get really stuck. So the way that that kind of manifested as an adult is to take the pain and put it into something that was purposeful, that gave back, that helped others. And so for Alzheimer's specifically, when my dad was diagnosed, I was like, what can I do? How can I help? How can we? I mean, this disease is, the more I learned, the more overwhelmed I got with like what we're up against as a society, especially with baby boomers getting up there. Yeah. The numbers are going to double. And so we're really in a, it's a crisis situation, especially wow. because, you know, right now in terms of caregivers, it's a $19 billion a year industry of unpaid services that's happening. Uh huh. People are having to quit jobs. They're having to quit college. Yeah. They're having to work two jobs, but then find someone else to take care of their loved ones. And I have to say the facilities out there are, um, you know, b- this might be controversial. I don't think so. I know what you're going to say. They're you not know, good enough. They're not. No, my, I take care of my mom. And, they're, they're, and I, she couldn't. We yeah. had a horrible and experience. And it's expensive. With, we had a horrible oh, experience no. with my dad. Oh, no. Until we found 11 places later this place in Jacksonville that was a godsend. But you rolled up to it. It was like a, like a tra- it looked like a trailer house kind of situation and on the side of the road. And you pulled up and you were like, this, well, this, this might, this can't be it. And it's that thing. Don't ever judge a book by its cover. Mm -hmm. Because in the side, the walls of that place, you know, there were no curtains. There was no nothing. They had no money financially to give to it because they they gave everything to their caretakers and to their, to the, to their people inside. They keep 10 people and they take care of them as if they're family. But it took us forever to find that place. And we had to go through hell to get there. Yeah, that's statistics. It's 10 people. It's statistics. Yeah. And if millions of families across the country are in this exact same position and they're going to places and listen, it is a hard, caregiving is the hardest job on the planet. It is. Which is why besides the Alzheimer's Association, when I got deeper into this, you know, I uh, there was a woman that reached out to me in 2020. Her name is Elizabeth Humphreys. She reached out and said, I've seen on Instagram that you, your dad has Alzheimer's, your grandfather died from it, or my dad, your, my dad has Pick's disease. And she's like, my mother's diagnosed. I started an organization called Mind What Matters, and I, it's to give care grants to caregivers. Wow. 
um, I would love to like chat with you and see if this is something you want to get involved with. I'm now the president of the organization. And all we do is give care grants to caregivers of loved ones with Alzheimer's and dementia because it is seriously the hardest job because the op other option of putting your, your family member somewhere mm -hmm. and not knowing whether they're getting taken care of or not, because let me tell you, the first time I arrived from, from California to get to my dad in Georgia at the first facility he was at, he was riddled with infection, mm. riddled. I had to immediately get him to a doctor. I had to immediately, I was like, had no one put eyes on this man? And I'm talking about this like this is something I've never talked about. But I'm talking about it because it is, it, for everyone out there, for every family who has somebody in a facility, and they don't, like, you go check on your loved one. Yeah, you have to. Be there. Yeah. Do not assume that they are taking care of them. Because the chances are, well, even if they have the best of intentions and a heart for caregiving, they're probably taking care of 20 people to one nurse or 20 people to one caregiver. It is an impossible game right now. Yeah. And so, you know, it's just hard. Yeah. So anything that we can do to help caregivers, okay. that's what Mind What Matters does. And then the Alzheimer's work really raises money for research, innovation, um, preventative uh, research. Mm -hmm. And so between the two of them, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm trying my best to make a difference. That's all that matters, yeah. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> You've got a lot going on. And then Children's Hospital, you know, yeah. after what we went through with Bennett, um, I mean, he, you know, he, his life was saved not once but three times From there. Children's Hospital? From Children's Hospital oh, of Los Angeles. That's amazing. And when, and then after that, I said, well, what can I do to help? How can I get to, involved? I was a spokesperson for a while. They asked me to join the board. Mm -hmm. I was like, of, of course. Yeah. And um, the thing about that hospital, which makes it so special, it's one of the busiest children's hospitals in the country. Yep. We have 600,000 kids that come through there every single year. It's number five in terms of specialty hospitals hospitals in the world. So what Children's does, most other hospitals, Children's hospitals cannot do. Right. Like St. Jude's is mostly cancer care, right? St. Jude's is cancer care. Yeah. And Children's does everything. Right. So if, you know, you can go, to, there's a lot of amazing Children's hospitals, but can they take care of your specific child's situation? Exactly. That's the question. Or where are you going to get the best care? The most important thing about Children's and why I will protect it for the rest of my existence is this one of only seven hospitals left in the country that are safety net hospitals. That means if you don't have insurance or a dime to your name, your, your child will not be turned away. We will find a way financially to help your family because no mother or father should ever have mm -hmm. to decide no. between less than care yeah. for their child mm -hmm. or going bankrupt yeah. for, for and, and saving their kid's life. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. And so it's when, not we, right, that's when for we sure. talk <laughs> about the measure of a good country, for me, it boils down to do we take care of our most vulnerable? Are we taking care of our children? Are we taking care of our elderly? Are we taking care of, of those who are going through mental illness? Are we taking care of our friends, the ones that are vulnerable to something in their lives? Like, are we doing that? And I would say we got a long way to go to get there. A lot of conversations. A lot of conversations yeah. that need to be had. Yeah. But that's where the work is, okay. in my opinion. Yeah. Thank you for all that you do. <laughs> I'm like, God, she's amazing. Oh, you're so sweet. Like, can you be my sister? Yes. Yeah. The answer to that is yes. That, oh, would, be so, that would be so fun. That's exciting. <laughs> and um, let's get you on Christmas movies. Oh, you know what? Your lips <laughs> to someone's ears, yeah. please. That would be amazing. Um, of course. Uh, thank you very much for coming on and really just being honest, you know, mm. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> hey, honestly, you in this we can't get anywhere if we're not honest yeah. about things. Like mm -hmm. it's true, and we have to also be able to absorb honesty. Yeah, you have to listen. You have to listen, and we have to absorb, and we have to really like go. No, I also want to make the world better. So let's hear each other out, um, and meet each person where they are. And so the fact that you're doing a podcast about being vulnerable, there's nothing more important than being vulnerable because the stats tell us, Brene Brown tells us, we don't know how to love, we don't have to have compassion, empathy, we don't know how to do any of that unless we have vulnerability.
So thank you for what you do. Oh, thanks, guys. And where can we find you online and everything? Oh, um, on Instagram at Nick, N-I-K, Deloach. And then Twitter, just Nikki Deloach. And I, I can't get into my TikTok account, so I don't know like what that is actually. I'm it's literally, I, It's like, I, I don't know. I can't find my password. I don't know what's happening, but I'll figure it out. Okay, Come perfect. find me there too at some point. Find her. She's amazing. We love you, Nikki. Thank you. Thank you so much. 